It says we're live. I forgot I have an intro video that I should have used. But as you can tell, camera's way over there. You can see the laptop. Should be able to hear me clearly. We got the good camera. We got the laptop set up. Shouldn't have any problems. We're in the studio. Well, it's, you know, in the garage. You can actually see that the race car that I've been building for a long time exists. It's still here. We're still working on it. That's some parts hanging out. I I set this up because I was going to use the whiteboard, and then I realized that the markers I have are not uh, in a right bold enough, so you guys can't see it from way back there. So <laughs> we may or may not adjust the camera at some point so that you guys can see more. Uh, I am going to walk up there in a minute because I will show you guys these up close, uh, but it's going to change the focus, and I don't want to do that because it might not focus back properly. Uh, yeah, so... What's up, Delaney? Delaney's watching from YouTube. That's right. We are on YouTube tonight. Last night we had some problems and we couldn't dual stream, but the goal is, is to dual stream the month of December. This is our December to remember event. I'm going to go live every day except for Christmas. It might be a short one. might be from my cell phone in my van. might be here like this. I don't know. Might even get the studio back around. Okay? So tonight we are going to talk about off-season prep and how you can build a new car or you can work on your old car for success and maybe I can run you guys through some stuff that'll save you some time, money, energy, or effort. So yeah, uh, Delaney, I did see the new build. It looks pretty awesome. And what's up, Mr. Slaughter? Ms. Slaughter says, uh, hello, Mr. NASCAR. All right, so I'm gonna let you guys in on something. I said this last night. Uh, my YouTube audience hasn't heard it, <laughs> but I actually do get to do something kind of cool uh, that's, uh, you know, professional level. I got invited to an invite-only race. Now, it might be just because I signed up as media for PRI, but they have a go-kart event that is going to happen at PRI next weekend on Thursday. I don't know why they wouldn't let me race this one. Uh, they have a pro event, so they have pro drivers coming in. Uh, and I actually just shared that list with somebody. Uh, so on Thursday, they are going to have, uh, these are the pro drivers that they have, which I haven't heard of all of these. They have Jacob Abel from the Indy NXT series, Jay Howard from IndyCar, Connor Daly uh, from IndyCar, Connor Hall from NASCAR, Kyle O'Gara from the 500 Sprint Car Tour, Jared Mees with the American Flat Track, Kevin Thomas with the World of Outlaws Spring, uh, Sprint Car, Rome Carpen Carpentier, uh, from Formula Drift, Austin Prock from NHRA Top Fuel, Jordan Vandergriff from NHRA Top Fuel, and Scott Birdsall from the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Um, they are going to be racing on Thursday during the happy hour event. They're actually going to do some racing. Friday, uh, we get to, uh, I get to, to race. I am media or a racing influencer is how they say it, uh, how they explain it here. Thursday, the e-cart racing action continues throughout the weekend. Uh, oh, after they take it on Thursday. On Friday, media and racing influencers will be laying down hot laps to see who's fastest around the circuit. And then Saturday, we'll hot uh, spotlight top youth cart racers from MSTEM3, focused high schools and career centers around the country, partnering with the Top Cart USA EV Grand Prix Racing Program. So Thursday is all about people like me who have a media pass. Um yeah, that's why I got invited. Not because I'm a racing influencer. I do not feel that I am important. Don't think this has gone to my head. I think it's really cool, but I am positive that they just reached out to anybody with a media pass and offered this opportunity. So I will not actually be racing against other people. It'll be a hot lap situation, but hoping to represent fairly well. So I'm just saying, just saying, I'm hoping to represent, okay? Go-karts aren't necessarily my best... Not my best discipline. Uh, I'm going to blame it on the old, uh, you know, weight. We'll say it's because I'm way more, okay? My buddy Mike likes to disagree all the time. I'm just saying. So, Travis, I got to text you back, my friend. I will say this, Travis. If you can get to Indianapolis, Indiana next weekend, I'm sure we can make room. You can come hang out with us. You can come hang out in the hotel. So, you really need to come to PRI at some point. You really do. Uh, this year, I think they're saying that there's, uh, like, 14 or 1600 vendors that are going to be there. So, yeah. All right, let's get started on why I have 
a dirty bumper cover and a dirty fender on top of my dirty car, okay? This is a car that I was building to make the Freedom Factory race last February, uh, as you can see. Uh, we're not there. Uh, I am. Th th it's quite far along. Fuel cell mount is in and done. Uh, the rear suspension uh, is done. The cage is 95% done. The main cage is in. A lot of the supports are in. I do have to finish welding out a bunch of it. Um, I got my strut tower reinforcement. I knew that was going to happen. It was very shaky. I got my strut tower reinforcements done, and I've started on the front body work. There is still a lot to do as far as like rub rails and stuff, but I've got the seat mount. I got the seat belt mounts. I've got my uh, accumulator mount. I got my battery box. Like I've got a lot done to it, but now we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty, right? Um, yeah. This car for me is a no compromise build. This is everything I've wanted to do to a race car for the last seven years. Cause that's the last time I built a car for me it was 2015. So this has the cage. Yeah, this is, this has started out as a Dickinson's cage um, kit and we've just added a bunch to it. But I have this thing set way back here. Um, it is honestly eight inches farther back. The, the main hoop is eight inches farther back than my old car, which gives me so much more flexibility with my seat. Uh, so this one sits where I want. My head is right about here. Uh, I'm going to be able to sit really low in the car, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So because of that, no compromise, because of this list of stuff that I want to do, um, the car for Daniel. No, this is my car. This, this is, this is my baby. Uh, his name's Ben Frank Frankenstein for a long time. So we're going to, we're going to have some name based off that. Okay. Yeah, somebody somebody stole the power steering unit out of it. Yeah, the power steer the steering system was done, and then we had to take the power steering unit out, put it in Pete's car. Uh, which how do you like that, Pete? So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh all right. Because of the no compromise build, because of the list of things that I wanted to do, uh, what we did when we started this is we brought this car in and I actually sat down and made a plan for the car. And I know that that sounds really, really simple. And it sounds like something that, you know, you're like, Todd, I already, listen, man, I got a plan for the car. Okay. Bring it in, tear it apart, put stuff on it, go win races. All right. Hey, it's a good plan. Okay. Might add some bullet points on each one of those. Right. I've built a few cars over the years. Um, and it's really given me some insight on how to make a plan that works and has, is going to let you have success, okay? What I see a lot of people do when they're building cars, when they're building a new car, okay, is they bring it in, they strip it, they start just cutting all the sheet metal out of it that they can, that they think they should, uh, however they think they should, and then they just toss a cage in it, and then they just adapt everything to that, okay? The plan that you have, you need to actually sit down and figure out what all you are going to do to the car you're building, okay? So this car for me, I knew that I wanted to, I had the main cage, uh, and then under that for bullet point, I knew that I wanted it to be set back so that I could put the seat in it properly. I wanted it to sit as low as possible. Uh, my seat, I knew that I wanted to uh, have some bracing go down to the right side. I knew I wanted to have some bracing come to the back. I knew that I wanted to have a my door plates over here. I have full door plates. I go from sill to sill with a full plate. Um, this car, I actually did individual plates in between the bar. Using the bar, instead of having a large um, plate cover the outside. I did that to save some weight with the individual pieces. Um, so, But I knew I wanted to have that. So when I ordered the cage from Larry... Um, I actually reached out to him, said, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Like, I want this cage from you, but I, I don't need, like, I want to change. I got the more fancy kit, but I didn't want the bulge door bars on the right side. And, um, I wanted the X, you know, but I, like, I didn't need any of the extra, some of the extra stuff. I'm going to add all my own. I didn't need door plates or any of that because I knew the plan that I had. I knew the, I, the, the vision in my head with what I wanted to do. 
I knew that in this car, I wanted to add electric power steering that I was gonna mount right off the, the uh, cage here. I knew that I wanted to have this set up for a hydraulic clutch, so I knew I was gonna have to modify the pedals and all of that. Uh, I knew that I was going to run my shifter cables through, so I'm gonna need to make a plate. Uh, I'm just thinking of some of the things off the top of my head right here for the interior. Now, I had the idea for a couple things that I've done in this car that I've never done before. One, I actually put the battery right here behind me, behind my seat down in this corner. Um, I actually, it's one of them right now where I usually tell, I don't like that placement. I'll be honest with you, I really don't like that placement. I decided to place it there for a couple reasons. One, how I have this welded in, what I have it welded to, uh, it is the most protected spot in the car. Okay, um, if that manages to fold, if something manages to happen to that battery, I probably don't care that something's happened to the battery because something has happened to me, okay? Also, I'm running an Optima battery. Um, so there's no acid to leak out. The gel battery, even if it gets damaged, it's not splashing battery acid all over me, okay? The other part is too, is that how I welded the battery box in here um, is very, very secure. I see a lot of people that just kind of half-ass a plastic box behind the driver's seat. And if they were getting into a hard enough wreck, that battery's coming out, can arc across the back of their seat, can cause some real problems, okay? Um, Will wants to know where you got the door plate. So this is actually some plate steel that Earl managed to uh, bring home from the scrap yard that somebody brought in for scrap that happened to be thick enough. Uh, so it was just some plate that I cut the proper sizes I need out of. So when I get like, when I get like steel plating and stuff like that, honestly, go check out rescue metals, uh, over in K zoo. But otherwise we either buy the pieces with the cage kits, uh, that we've had, or we'll buy like the door plates or just find steel from Alro or something like that. So now the other thing with the battery, uh, that I knew I wanted to try to do this car, I'm not racing anywhere with a left side weight rule. So I am trying to put all of the weight on the left side of the car if possible. So my accumulator in the old car sat on the right-hand side of the trans or the exhaust tunnel, so I knew I wanted to try to move it over here onto the left. Um, so that was something that I wanted to plan on. Um, I knew that I wanted to reinforce the strut towers in the back. I knew I wanted to reinforce the strut towers on the front, and I wanted to tie them in a little bit. I don't normally do that, but this car, I built it with the intent that I can cut the roof off and everything is still just as solid, so that's why I wanted to tie those strut towers in. Um, I knew that the front end, I wanted to just tube from essentially the mounts forward, um, stuff like that. I knew that on this car, I was gonna run all my own brake lines. Uh, I knew I was gonna run all my own fuel lines. Uh, so none of that was a problem. I could take all of that off the car. I could cut all the mounts off. Um, those are the things that if you put into your plan can really help you before you start cutting into things. Because if I was to start building this car and I wasn't gonna run new brake lines and the brake lines looked good, I would wanna make sure when I'm cutting the sheet metal out that I'm not gonna cut into the brake lines. I, don't, I wanna make sure I keep all the mounts for them uh, as an example, right? Now, having that plan in place and knowing like, okay, I wanna put the seat in here and I want it to lay down as much as possible, but I actually, I kinda wanna put the battery and I wanna put the accumulator back here too. So the most important part of that whole equ equation with the plan is my seat, okay? So in that instance, having that plan, put the seat in, now I can start making room for my accumulator and my battery box. If I was to put those in first and just, hey, this would be a good spot for this. Um, and, and, and this actually happened because I was planning on putting my fire suppression system uh, down here in one corner too. Um, it doesn't fit doesn't fit anywhere like I thought it would. And I actually had the mounts made up, tacked in, thought it was gonna be great, thought it was gonna be, thought I was really doing something, okay? Um, then I set the seat in and realized, nope, doesn't fit there, doesn't fit there, doesn't fit there. So if I'd done all the work of putting all of those pieces in where I thought they would work and thought they'd be great, I would've had to cut them all out instead of just kind of cracking a tack loose to hold it in place, right? Um, is that a plastic fender? That plastic fender, everybody's asking about the fender, which is why I was here. I actually had the nose sitting up here too, but it was too bright, it was throwing the camera off. <laughs> yes, 
This is a Dominator plastic fender. It fits the Dominator street stock nose, which is sitting right there. It is the same nose that I had on the previous car. Um, the previous car, I used stock neon fenders, and I just adapted them together. This car is not going to have stock doors, and I'm going to cut more of the quarter panel sheet metal off, and I'm going to do some aluminum on the side. We're really going to take some weight off the car that way. And because I'm doing that, I thought, why not get the fenders that match the bumper? And it'll be a lot easier to go from here forward, basically. So yes, this is the Dominator front fender that goes with their street stock nose. You can obviously tell it's in green. Um, if it doesn't look green to you, you might be colorblind. You should go check that out with the doctor, okay? <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I don't think I ever gave you crap about fenders, Dan. Also, not that I remember. If I did, I don't remember it. Also, the car, like the car that's going to Bristol, the old car, again, stock neon fenders. Um, this car will not race VCTS. Uh, it's going to race the National Series. It's going to race locally. And they've basically said that as long as it's a front-wheel drive, they don't care. So, yeah, we're not going to be behind the times. Uh, if everybody else is putting plastic and aluminum all over their cars, that's what we're going to do, too. So, hence the no compromise on this one. I probably could have this car ready to go to Bristol, but I don't want to have to redo the body the way I want to do it after I make it VCTS, okay? Um, yeah, looks orange, yeah. Yeah, as Greg, uh, as Greg said, it's a nice chassis. This is actually, this, it, Greg, I'm still so glad you sold us this car because um, this thing is clean. Uh, how many miles does this have on it, Greg? Uh, not a lot. Uh, if you are a neon purist, you're going to be upset because this is a uh, 22Y VIN code car. Uh, and I don't care. So, yeah. This is an actual uh, from the factory Dodge race guy. It's an ACR. Don't care. Cut her up. She was clean. It's the most rust-free first gen I've ever built. So, yeah. Uh, no, I'm not making a stab at people's bodies. Um, and I, honestly, Will, yours still looks like a Civic. Um, you know, you, it, it, it really is a case of with the body rules with this car. And this is, this is part of why I had the fender and the bumper up here too, that you guys should take into account for your plan. Okay. Before we cut anything off this car, um, I knew that I wanted to run that front bumper. I really like the dominator street stock front bumper cause it's the right width. Um, they're only like 76 inches wide. So they'll cover the front wheels without having to cut a bunch out of the middle. You can tweak them a little bit. They actually, look, they, they're the right width, in my opinion, for a front-wheel drive car. So I like the look of it. I think it's aggressive. I like the look of that bumper. So I wanted to reuse it again. Okay. Uh, 118,000. There is no way this thing had 118,000 on it. Wow. Anyways. <laughs> um, like, it's got the patina, but it does not have the rust underneath. Wow. I, man, that just blew my mind. 116. Man, but the reason that you should figure out what you want to do for the body to begin with is because there is a lot of sheet metal that you either need to keep or cut based on what you do for a body, okay? Um, also, I do want to point out, the reason that I also like the Dominator stuff, these fenders fit really well with the, uh, the Fortune at 790s. A 23 doesn't look too small inside of it, and a 24 is almost the right size to go inside these. Um, I see all the time guys that put the ABC front bumper or front fenders on and stuff. Like, it can be a clean look, but I it's a personal thing. I'm not saying that you do a bad job. I'm not saying that, like, I'm not, I'm not shitting on you for it, but the, the wheel openings on those fenders are so big because they are made to accommodate an 86, 87, 88 inch tire, um, they are so big that when you stick a 23 Hoosier in there or a 24, it looks so goofy to me because the fender arch is up so high and the tire's so little, it's just this massive opening. And I, I just, it bothers me. I don't like that look. Um, I just, I just don't like that look, okay? And I wanted to avoid it. Uh, we got a set of these and started setting them kind of on the car with the, like against it, uh, with the tires and stuff on it. And they fit really, really well. And I've actually known a couple people who now have put 
um, the fenders on their car. And it looks great in the pictures. It does not have that gap. So, and you guys are asking me about prices, um, uh, what they cost. I will be dead honest with you guys. Okay. I don't know. And the reason I don't know is that, um, I have a car owner who is paying for this build. So I don't actually pay for these parts. Um, but we also buy them through union city speed shop. Who's my brother-in-law. He gives us a bit of a discount because I talk about his stuff all the time. I help him out all the time as much as I can. So we get a bit of a discount and he's my brother-in-law, right? So I don't know what we paid for him. Uh, I said, hey, I need the uh, front, uh, front bumper. I need the fenders. And then I also need, we got this box right here. Uh, so this was Dominator's, their new product last year. Uh, you can probably see this uh, uh, blue right here, okay? Um, this is their front bumper valance kit. So we're going to put that on this year because um, somehow magically we went from like six, seven inch ride heights to guys can't get their cars that high and we got to have one inch ride heights. So when they do away with the ride height, awesome. And we're going to go ahead and put the front nose on the ground. So we got that box for the valance and we got this box over here, which I'm kind, I'm kind of excited to make these work. Uh, this is also a Dominator product, not sponsored by Dominator in any way. I've talked to them. I've tried. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, we got that blue again. Uh, this is their side skirts. So we're going to use their side skirts, and we've got enough to do both sides and the extra piece uh, to be able to make some for behind the bumper as well. So I'm really excited. I have a vision of how I want this body to look. We're going to see if I can make that happen. Um, but the nice part when you start um, doing this plan and start your build is that I can I could call up my brother-in-law because we wanted orange. He didn't have them in stock. Motor State didn't have them in stock, and I was able to say, "Hey, order them that way." And we could have special ordered them. We could have paid more. We could have had them shipped in. But because I knew we wanted them and I knew we had time, excuse me, we were able to put them on a stocking order. So Motor State went ahead and they had them in their back order, so that when they ordered from Dominator and Dominator brought up their big stock order, they were in there. We didn't have to pay the extra shipping and stuff. And we were able to get our front bumper, our valance, our side skirts, our fenders, the colors that we wanted. There we go. Now, if I had waited to last minute and I've got the cage done and I got all the rest, I'm like, no, no, no. what front bumper should I put on? What about, you know, what, what fenders? You know, I could be waiting a month, two months to get the body that I want put on it when I could have had those parts sitting and waiting and ready to put, be put on. Uh, and the other part of that too, by knowing what front bumper and what rear bumper you want to use, if you're going to use a rear bumper, which I should point out, by the way, this is actually just a standard uh, ABC rear bumper. Um, I had I had this style bumper on uh, my old car before. I switched to the Challenger rear style, and it just it doesn't it, it it's it's not going to be able to give me the look that I want. So we went back to that ABC. Um, but when you start. If you're going to cut off sheet metal and you're going to tube it and all of that, this allows me to go through and actually make sure that I know, okay, this bumper is going to be this width. It's going to be this high. Okay, when I'm building frame rails or I'm building gussets out the back, when I'm building my, my structure back here, I can take that into account. Okay, if I have the opportunity to run a frame rail off the side or, you know, extend it out, well, if I could extend that out and then kind of angle it up or angle it down to match that rear bumper, that could save me a lot of time by having that plan written out and saying, okay, I, I want that front bumper. I need to make sure I get that front bumper. Same thing is going to go for the sides, for the doors. Okay. If I'm going to start skinning this thing out and I don't know what I'm going to do for the body yet, well, I might go ahead and I might skin the, the stock doors and mount them back up and get that all ready. But then I realize I look at the rules and I see there's not, I don't have to have those and they're heavy. We did a, uh, I did the show when we first started cutting this thing, well, over a year now, well, about a year ago now, um, of how much the stock doors on Lucy weighed because they were gutted stock doors that just had the front flange so the hinges stayed on, but all the rest of it was gutted out. And they were still, I want to say they were 16 to 18 pounds each. Well, I'm going to put aluminum over all of that. There's no reason to keep those doors. So I just saved myself some work. It might even be a case of I can take them things off and two-door neons are getting a little more rare. 
I could sell that whole door if it's nice. You might be able to do the same thing where you've just saved yourself a bunch of money and you've been able to keep parts that you can sell off or have for the future. If somebody complains you got aluminum on and they change the rules, you got to put the door back on, you still have it, right? So planning out your entire build, okay? The brake system on this car, is the same that we're uh, that we've been doing uh, as far as all the lines and everything like that. Um, we just use the stock fittings into the master cylinders and stuff. But when I get out to the wheels, what I've done instead of buying the aftermarket stainless steel braided brake lines for a Dodge Neon, uh, we actually uh, is this one of them? Yep. I just use lines like this. This is a straight and a forty-five. Um, and it's a, it's a dash three. What this allows me to do is I buy the banjo bolt adapter fittings for the front calipers. And I buy the adapters for the rear wheel cylinders that are just dash three AN. And then I get the uh, flare to dash three AN adapters that mount onto the frame rail. And then I just need those brake lines. And the same brake line goes on all four corners. So I only need one or two additional of the adapters just in case something happens. Say I get into a wreck and I wipe, wipe the left front off the car and it breaks the adapter and breaks the brake line. I can swap brake caliper on. I can swap brake line on. We're good to go, right? But I only have to have one or two spare of the adapters. And I only have to have one or two spare of the brake lines. And these bad boys are like, I want to say nine bucks or so, 10 bucks, okay? So when I build the kit out to start, I'm not saving any money over just buying the factory braided uh, steel brake lines. But at 100 to $125 for another set of stainless steel brake lines, if I want a spare set, even just to have in the shop in case something happens, because look, I don't ever think they're going to fail, but I do think that the possibility is there that I run over something or I hit something or I get hit and I break the brake line. I've done it. Okay. So I want to have a spare so I don't have to, oh crap, where do I got to order it? Right. So by doing that setup, it allows me to know that I need to have all of those parts. So having my plan, knowing I'm gonna go through the brake system, knowing I'm gonna put brake lines on it, knowing I'm gonna put these stainless brake lines on it, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna grab all those parts and pieces so that, you know, I'm not ready for any of that stuff yet, uh, but I know when I am, I have the adapters, I have the lines, right? And you might have to wait to order the lines. The first time we did that on Lucy, uh, I had to put all the adapters and everything on, and then I had to measure the lines, right? You might also have to do that. Uh, so that might be something that, hey, you know what? I need to prioritize getting the tabs put where I want them and making sure the suspension's hung where I want it so that I can measure those lines so I can get them ordered early, right? So, um, hey, you have a good night too, Dan. Thanks for stopping in, bud. Uh, so this is what I did back in 2016. Yeah, I didn't. I don't put the lines on that until like 2018 or so. Um, I kept telling myself I needed to do stainless line, need to do stainless line, need to st do stainless lines. Then I had brake issues I couldn't solve, and then I put stainless lines on, and it helped tremendously. So, yeah. Um, and don't worry, guys. Uh, I had planned on I'm going to get – when I, I'm going to make a video on how I do the brake lines when I get to that point. Uh, but I'll have all the fittings and stuff like that. So if you have a neon, you could copy my setup, get all the fittings and whatnot. It's something I've even thought about trying to put on the front drive shop where you can have those adapter fittings uh, so that they'll work. So maybe maybe we'll go that far, but you'll at least get the information. Um, the same with that plan goes through all the rest of your stuff as far as suspension too, okay? Um, on this car, it's no secret. I run the Shadow Knuckles. Uh, I run the How Ball Joints. We run all Moog tie rods. Um, I run uh, some poly bushings and some other bushings in my control arms. Uh, the rears are all Heim joint swedge tubes and poly bushings for the trailing links. So I need to know that I'm gonna do all of that stuff. I might need to modify my control arms um, or even just press in, press out bushings, ball joints and stuff like that. Uh, I might need to source the Heims. In the case of this car, the uh, suspension mounting point back here um, I took an executive de uh, decision. The factory one was not, um, wasn't that bad, but we drill these out for, they, we drill them out for half inch bolts anyway. 
And I just made the decision that we went ahead and we cut out the center section and I made one out of a square tube. Don't worry, it's not cheated up. Bring your tape measure, bring, bring the measuring devices that I would have available to me here. And you can measure that compared to a stock neon. They're in the factory location. Uh, Lucy, the old car actually has three tubes on each side. Uh, so it does have some adjustments built in, but I never ever changed the adjustments. So we didn't do that with this car. We just put one tube in it. They're in the factory location. Okay. But getting all of those parts and pieces because of my plan, I knew that I wanted to do that. Now, if it was one of those of that I was planning on, like I, I didn't have the forethought and I put all the bracing back here and I put the fuel cell back here and all of that. Right. Well, I might not have had the room and I might have had to have cut a bunch of bars out to be able to do that suspension. With having the fuel cell, my fuel cell's right here, okay? Passenger, behind passenger seat, that's where it's been in that car for a long time. Um, having the extra down bars and the kicker bars the way that I did, I did the fuel cell first because I didn't want to have to work around all of these monkey bars, okay? To be able to get in and out, to be able to try things, right? By knowing that I wanted to do the fuel cell there, by having the plan of doing the fuel cell there, I didn't do any of the rest of this stuff so that I didn't have it in the way to work on that. Um, the other thing that I did is once I had that all done, I don't have the can put in it. The can's actually sitting here in the seat. Um, I took it out because I'm going to paint this and I'm going to have other stuff. But what I've done the entire time as I go through, um, there's one bar in here that I particularly went, ooh, I want to make sure I can still get the cell in and out with that bar there. So once I made it, I tacked that bar in and then I made sure I could still snake, excuse me, the can down in and through. Kind of a pain in the butt, but I can do it. So I don't have to worry about it. I can paint all of this, finish out it all uh, without having to worry about having that can in there and getting it damaged or painted over or anything like that. So because I had the plan, because I had the forethought, and I knew that I was going to be doing all of that. I was able to avoid that. Okay. Now the planning stage, this plan that you want to do, you need to extend that to every other part of the car as well. What computer are you going to run? What are you going to do for a wiring harness? What are you going to do for an engine? What are you going to do for a transmission? What are you going to do for a clutch? What are you going to do for an axles? What are you going to do for a steering rack? What are you going to do for steering knuckles? Um, you know, all of those parts and pieces of the car. And I know that I know that some of you are going to stay are going to sit there and be like, that is so much work, Todd. That is so much stuff to think about. I can't focus on all of that. I get it, the ADHD stuff. I really get it. But knowing, if you wait till March to try to go racing in April to figure out what you're doing for an engine, you're behind the eight ball, okay? But if you can get the block to the machine shop in October or November or December, you are so much farther ahead than the guy trying to sneak it in last minute. Hey, man, I just got my taxes back. Can I, can I get my motor in and get it done? You might not make open at night, right? Um, you might not, these neons, you cannot buy big camshafts for these. Can't do it. Um, the people that have them, uh, accuse us stock car guys of, of ruining parts and all this and that, because we're using parts in our cars and they might get damaged, but they're just hoarding sets of them, you know? So you can't get big cams. So if I'm building, planning to build from stock to a great big fire breathing monster, well, I'm going to be able to get all the parts. So if I'm not searching as soon as possible, I'm not going to have them. Right. Um, why are you going with the shadow knuckles? Because they're better, Patrick. A <laughs> couple reasons. The wheel bearings, significantly better. Uh, the shadow knuckles, if you go with a Timken bearing, they actually have a dual roller design inside of them instead of the recycl or recirculating ball. Uh, but they also have a different ball joint uh, mount location. So it's like running an extended ball joint. Um, if you care about such a thing, you can actually run bigger brakes with these two. They have an 11 inch rotor available, uh, with a different, uh, caliper. I run neon calipers and neon rotors. Um, they, it's a 10 inch option as well, but they're also way stronger. Um, they are heavier. They're significantly heavier. They're four or five pounds heavier a corner. Um, but if you break one of these bad boys, you really got to take a shot. So geometry is just a little bit better. They are a stock part. Um, yeah, if any of you guys have a K series in a first jet, like in an earlier Civic, and you want to come at me for my knuckles, just just think about that. This is still a Dodge front wheel drive. It's still make to make, right? Just saying, just saying. So yeah, Dad's got some neon cams, but Dad knows as well as I do they're not the good ones. So because <laughs> Crane stopped making them, right? 
if you have to grab yourself a notebook for this plan okay the plan for this car is primarily in my head uh i've talked it out with earl we sat down we've talked about this car at length okay um so it's primarily in my head but we do have a list it's pinned to it's pinned over there of all the stuff that we got to do it's just line items okay but it's easy to look at that and say, okay, here's the things we need to do. And read through your list and go, oh, you know, I need to make sure the can fits in here before I put all of this in. And I need to make sure that stuff fits behind the seat, right? You can save yourself so much time and energy by doing that. But everything, right? Everything possible you can think of down, okay? And all of this plan applies to your old car as well. So if you are if you're not building a new one, you're just using last year's car, and you're like, hey, I don't need to worry about the engine because I'm going to use the same one. I don't need to worry about trans because I'm going to use the same one. I don't have to worry about axles because I'm going to use the same one. I don't have to worry about brake lines because I'm not going to redo them. I'm not going to redo this or this or this or this or this. That's cool. That's awesome. Saves you a ton of time, a ton of energy. Okay. Still write your plan out and still think about every part of your race car, right? Put seat down, put belts down, put steering down, you know, put all of that on your list. Even if all you do is you look to make sure that your seat belts are good, you make sure that the belt or bolts are good, make sure your seat is bolted down good and proper like it should be, okay? Or you fix all of that stuff if it's not right, okay? Even if all you are doing is inspecting that part, brake lines, okay? You might not have realized that at some point during the season that a rock came up and whacked your brake line and you pinched it off and you actually haven't had one of your brakes working properly. Um, go through, just inspect it, okay? You might save yourself some headache during the year because these neons are notorious. The brake lines go up over the firewall, down that side, come back here, and then they hook and they go in between the fuel tank and... All righty, we should have some sound back. We're gonna refocus this back here. Wah. All right, can you hear me now? It might've came back for a minute and then, all right, so I'm using a Rode Wireless Go 2, which, oh my God, Travis, Travis, listen, buddy, if you wanna up your audio, these things are great, but do me a favor, by the lav mic. I can't tell you as a content creator, slight, slight ramp for like five seconds. Okay. I see these all the time where these, where people just have these clipped up here and it bothers me so much because it's so easy. My microphone is right here and it has a little cord and I put this in my pocket and you don't see it. <laughs> it bothers me. It bothers me so much because they're not, it's a $325 camera system the good road mic is only like 50 bucks. Just toss it on extra. Okay. Um, it just, yeah. Okay. Uh, sitting here's a deaf guy watching Todd tell his life story. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I love how so many of you chimed in that you lost sound. So I love you guys and gals. I do. I really do. Um, 
All right, let's go back here. Let's go back here. Um, so many drop sounds. Uh, yeah. Tech guy studying until 1 a.m. every night to tell the difference between uh, shadow and neon knuckle. Actually, it's super easy to tell the difference between shadow and neon knuckle. Just look at the, uh, if it has bolt-on wheel bearings or it has a bolt-on brake caliper bracket, it's not a neon uh, strut or a neon knuckle. Uh, well, technically, the SRT4s had bolt-on uh, ones, but they didn't have bolt-on uh, bearings. So, yeah. Uh, but you would need to know that part, right? <laughs> okay. Where can I get them? The Get what, Tom? The uh, knuckles? Uh, U-pull yards, junk yards, any place that you would buy used parts. Um, I and, and look, I'm not, I don't know. The shadow knuckle thing is one of those. I don't know the year. Uh, they're like the later model versions or runs of those. So you'll have to look because not all of them had the bolt-on caliper brackets. Not all of them had the bolt-on um, wheel bearings. And if they have those two things, they're guaranteed to have the ball joint location. But if they don't have those things, they may or may not have it. So, yeah, the fenders. Oh, okay, Tom. Where did I get the fenders? Where did I get these? Same place I got the front bumper, the rear bumper, the side skirts, and the front balance, Union City Speed Shop. So I buy, I get all my stuff, uh, any performance parts I can, I buy either straight from the manufacturer if I get to deal with them, so like driven racing oil, I, I buy from them. But otherwise, I, I get all my parts through Union City Speed Shop. So uh, my brother-in-law owns it, runs it, and I support local businesses. So as much as possible. So, yeah. All right. Um, if you are, the planning stages and that is so important for these cars to have that build out as far as being able to do things in the order that you need and make sure you have the parts you need. And it does apply to your old car as well, as far as being able to do that kind of stuff. Now, the other thing that you need to try to do outside of just the planning part of all of this is when you are working on these cars, okay, don't be afraid to go slow even with your plan. And I know that that's going to sound goofy, okay, but I have seen three or four times now where people have brought cars in and they're going to build them. And this is primarily in the cutting of everything stage. And they just start taking a plasma cutter or a sawzall or an angle grinder, and they just start hacking everything out. Or they're like, well, I don't need any of these wires we're doing. <laughs> and they start cutting wires out instead of unplugging or unbolting or anything like that. Um, they start smashing and hammering and all that. And it ends up costing them in the long run because, oh, man, I cut all the support out for, for the strut tower, and it moves now. You know, like I don't know why my car's... Like it's just it just doesn't go like it should. It doesn't handle like it should. Well, it's it's super easy to get this plasma cutter back out. It's super easy to get the sawzall back out, right? When you're cutting stuff, leave extra. Like I cut the structure out in between the frame rails, like the sheet metal and stuff. I'm putting things in it. Now I've built enough of these. I know how far I want to go at this point. But the first few times um, that I've done that like that I was doing this, I literally would cut it and then I'd leave two inches between the frame rails and everything. And then I'd come back in later and take a little bit more off or take a little bit more off um, to get it where I needed it to go. And it has just saved me so much by not overdoing. I've had to answer questions to guys like, hey, how do I repair this? How do I repair that? How do? I oh man, the suspension here. And wiring is the biggest one. Um, we're actually going to do a tech show real soon. Um, I actually, it might be next Tuesdays because I have gotten asked about this a few times. I'm going to teach you guys how to read a wiring diagram and some basics on how to fix wires um, and how to actually figure out and make your own standalone harnesses. A standalone harness um, is not that difficult, okay? All it is is just removing the stuff you don't need. I don't need the wiring for the dome light in this car. I don't need the wiring for the taillights in this car, right? I don't need the wiring for the EGR in this car. What I do need is the cam sensor, crank sensor, uh, fuel injectors, all that kind of stuff, right? So a standalone harness is either somebody building a new harness with all new connectors and all new pins and all new wire and then covering it all, or they just take a stock harness and they just cut out all the shit that you don't need. And so many people, when it comes to wiring, I get this so much, you know, it's the devil spaghetti, right? They, they want nothing to do with it because 
it's so confusing and so just, oh, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what that is. I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what, I don't know how to wire diagram. I don't know how, you know, it's so intimidating to people. And it, it is very simple. It, it, some of you are never going to believe me with that phrase, but it is really simple. But it is so, so much better. If you don't know what you're doing with wiring, especially to just unplug things and to take the time to pull connectors off and to fish the wire through and to pull the boots out and stuff like that. Um, first off, you might be able to just sell your whole wiring harness. Even if you're, you know, if you're building a cavi and you're going to buy a wiring heart, you know, a Jason Waters wiring harness and all that and standalone and whatnot, or you're going to, you're building a Honda. Uh, well, actually, the cavies now you can get them from Alan Carter down at Southeast Performance. If you're going to just throw one of his harnesses in, hey, it won't matter. I'm not. I'm literally not going to use any of this. Just cut it all out of the way. Look, if you're building a new car, you might be able to sell that harness. You know, if you're building an Integra, and you know the wiring harness is still good in it, I'm sure that there's somebody that will buy that from you. So by you cutting it, you could throw fifty, hundred, two hundred bucks right in the trash can, right? Because the scrap price of wire is not. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it ain't it ain't worth, right? You're going to make more selling the whole, okay? So by just undoing everything, by slowing down and taking your time, you can either save yourself money or you can save so much headache, okay? And the same thing when goes with building a harness. I can't see the amount of times I have seen people's advice to build a standalone harness where their advice is, you start the car and then you just start cutting shit. And if you cut it, and it stays running, you don't need it. And if you cut it and it shuts off, well, you just fix that wire and then you cut the next one. Don't do that. <laughs> you just got yourself a whole lot of extra work, a whole lot of extra time, you know? Uh, with a Nissan, it's that engine management is integrated with some body control stuff. If certain circuits aren't fed, other things won't work. It's pretty confusing unless you're good at electrical and know how uh, know it like myself. And Josh says, uh, good luck on the newer Ford there, Paige. Yeah, the newer the car gets, okay, the 2003 up neons have a completely different computer system in them. They need the security system around the key and everything. Like they need so much more than the old first gens did, right? The newer your car, the more chances are there's another module required to make it run. Um, so that's the uh, that's another part of not just hacking all the wires out, right? That's also why you don't just whack, go at stuff, okay? Um, but there's so much of it where if you slow down when you're doing your build, you're going to be better off, okay? Um, the amount of people, too, that I see that guys will come in and they just they strip the car down and they just throw a cage in as quick as they can. Um, and then they after the cage and everything's in, well, now they want to scrape the stuff off the floor, right? Or now they want to paint certain stuff. You know, I got the body all done. Let's paint the cage. Well, now it's a pain in the butt because now I got all this stuff out here, right? Uh, but slowing down, taking a second, being like, hey, We'll get the cage in, but let's let's get the floor cleaned out first, right? One thing that I do when I'm building these things that people look at me real weird until I explain it, these are the last part to go on the car is these door bars right here. I will tack them in to make sure that everything's where they're supposed to be, and then I take them back out. Uh, and the reason is it is so much incredibly easier to build a seat mount and to build the steering column and to build, like in my case, this, the battery box and that does actually something all it's so much easier to build all that with this giant opening right and i have seen guys that throw these in weld them all in and then they complain oh, i can't get my fetus you know how hard it is to get my fetus yeah you just you blocked your door right by slowing down taking a second and going hey i mean if i put these door bars and i flip them this way they won't be in the way the same distance is the same i can tack them in and I can weld everything out, and I still have this giant hole in here. And then once everything's welded where it needs to be, I can crack those tacks off and pull those pieces out, and I still have this giant door opening, and then I can put those in last. Welding my fuel cell cage in here, right? Weld my down bars in. Welding, like I said, my accumulator mounts. Weld my battery box. Um, I have a plate that I've welded to the floor and uh, that's integrated in with my seat mount and my belt mounts and all of that kind of stuff. That stuff was – and if you have someone helping you, and you want to put a piece down on the floor, like under the seat or something like that, like your seatbelt mount tabs. If you don't have all this stuff on the door, they can sit right there and just go. Otherwise, they got to try to kind of you know, lean in. And as for your containment seats, bigger stuff like that. But that's a slowing down a little bit, 
you know, allows me to have that. But if I'm in just such a hurry, I got to get the cage and I got to get it thrown in, it won't happen, right? The other part of that plan and slowing down is being able to think through all the steps involved with the cage. So in my case, you can't see it, but the dash, the dash, like the tin dash is going to go from the factory where the dash sits back to the, the uh, dash bar in the cage. Well, I see this a lot where guys will have that dash bar up or down, right? I go through and that is the first bar that I put into place where I want it to be. And I put a level on the dash and I bring it back to that dash bar and that's how I determine the height. That way, when I put my dash tin in, it goes straight, it sits level, so much nicer, so much easier to make, okay? Um, same thing with the rear tin. If I'm gonna go through, so this car, um, I've actually gone through and cut out around the strut towers a lot more than I normally do. But what I've kept um, is the area around here, the bottom of the back window. And I'll see guys just hack that right out. But then they have to brace all this stuff in for tin work. I have a natural curve that fits the body shape of the neon that gives me a one inch lip around it that's double reinforced. I mean, it's, it's a solid chunk, but it's a nice gradual level that's really nice for the tin work that's gonna fit really well with the body. I just didn't have to cut it out, right? But by slowing down and not just and hacking everything all to crap, now I've saved myself a lot of work in doing my tin work later. And this is one that because I still have this arc, when I make a deck lid to connect my rear bumper with this area, I can take the stock deck lid, lay it on something, trace that curve out, and now I have a nice form-fitting deal. I don't have to... The neon's around. These are a round, bubbly car, you know? So having square edges and square corners and, and all of that, square body lines, looks kind of goofy. So keeping that natural round curve makes it look significantly better, okay? Um, but slowing down, doing that, planning it out, allows me to do that, right? Now, the other part of this planning that it really helps is knowing what you need to be able to do all the tasks on your plan. If I'm gonna weld this car together, I'm gonna need basic fabrication tools. I'm gonna need at least one angle grinder. I'm gonna need, I could use that angle grinder as a cutoff wheel to cut tubing and pipe and all that, but I'm probably gonna want a Sawzall, right? I'm definitely gonna need a welder and I'm going to need a drill, okay? To be able to drill holes in places. So these are basic tools that I need. Well, if you don't own a welder, you're gonna to need to account for that. If you don't own an angle grinder, you need to account for that, right? So being able to plan all that stuff out. What's up, Robbie? Yeah, that's right, we're live. Yeah, Earl's inside. <laughs> Let somebody else in or something? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, I don't answer your message, so you just show up? Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> we have this chair here that it it won't tip over. You're gonna think you, it will though. It goes back. It goes all the way back, doesn't it? Like all the way. And it doesn't matter how who how many times people have sat in it, but the first time they sit in it again and they lean back, it goes an extra ten degrees farther than you should. And everybody kind of does that thing. So, yeah. Red says you should step in frame and say hi. If he steps in frame, he might bump the camera because it's real close to stuff. So, like, the can't, the tripod is, like, right on there. So, yeah. Here's a good question. Do you build your car flat or do you put wedge in the car when welding the cage in? We do it as flat as possible. I heard people flexing the car welding the cage in. Yeah. All right. So, we're going to have – this is we're going to kind of talk about this in our setup thing. It's not – it's a good question, okay? And I get this all the time. Well, what you got to do is you got to twist your car up and then block. Guys and gals, these uni unibody cars, if you don't cut anything between the strut towers and you keep the roof on it, you don't have the means inside your garage unless you have some hydraulics and something to chain the thing to the floor. You don't have enough to make any noticeable difference in your strut towers. Okay. These things are stiff as shit. All right. So... You can actually, you can, you can do it. 
Okay, if you have a way to chain the car down and you have a way to lift other corners, you can do that. Now, if you have it in your shop and you hack the roof off, so you just have the floor pan and you have these big gaping openings, yeah, you absolutely can make it flex, okay? But it's really hard to get it to twist. It's just really easy to make it flex, okay? So I, I set these things, when I'm gonna weld a cage in, when I'm building a car, I try to set it either where I want for ride height or I'll raise it high enough up in the air, I can work around it, and I just make it level. I make it level side to side, I make it level front to back, because then I know that if the rail that I'm putting this side on and the rail that I'm putting that side on both read level on the on the uh, um, zero on the bubble level or zero on the level finder, the car's level, it's gonna be built straight, it's not gonna twist, okay? If you guys wonder how much you can actually change the handling of your car, if you have coilovers, Raise your car up, adjust an eighth of an inch, and set it back down and see what the weight does. Raise it back up, you know, do that, and then think of how hard you would have to twist the car to get the top of your strut tower to move that distance, okay? If you, if you can move your strut towers a half inch, you can move your right rear down a half inch compared to your other three, yeah, you're gonna add a lot of wedge. A decent amount, I should say. But if you can get it to move a sixteenth of an inch, it ain't worth it ain't worth dicking with, right? So if you build your cars in that way where you twist them and you've always had great handling cars and you don't mind the extra work and all that, awesome. Go ahead and do it. I personally do not think you can twist one of these things hard enough to actually make that worthwhile. So call me crazy, okay? We got some PRI exclusive stickers. I know it's easier for you to see than them. I got it towards the end of this thing. I'm gonna walk up closer because if it'll like zoom funny, you know, I don't want it to or focus funny. But got some neat stickers. The wife designed them, so um, I feel like it's not a good idea. You can put wedge in a car. You can take it out if it's stuck there. I, I don't disagree with that, Kenny. You can't take it out. But the thing is, is that. I know where I want it to be. Like I can tell you right now, if I was going to twist one of these cars, I would take the right rear and I would, I, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do the rear. I would take the left front strut tower and I would move it as far to the earth as possible that I could get away with and not move any of the mounts on the suspension. Like if I could keep the K member mounts where they are, but I could take the strut tower and move it down a half inch or an inch. I absolutely would because I want that bent like that. That will never change. Um, and yeah, so hitting the wall just right makes them handle better. It can. It absolutely can. What about spacing under the bolts on the strut tower? You, yeah, if you can space it down like that, like you'll add weight, wedge, you'll add weight. It's just you're taking the top mount, you're taking the top of the spring and you're just trying to move it down. That's what you're trying to do. So yeah. Um, the other thing as far as your planning stage and how to ensure success in the winter, and this one might sound goofy, is talking to your sponsors. Talking to the people that are going to help you out that you're going to put on the car. Um, the reason that might help, I got these got these green fenders. If, if the camera might look make them look different, I just got these green fenders. You know, if they if they don't look green, they're colorblind. I thought it was funny, you know. But if I got a sponsor whose primary colors are red and black, and they're going to pay me a lot of money, I'm not going to have orange fenders, right? It just so happens that the primary sponsor of this car, uh, their colors are orange and black for both the show and the store that they run, you know? So that's the primary colors of the car. But if your sponsor wants certain primary colors or they want a certain spot on the car or they want certain parts on the car or you want to upgrade certain parts, go talk to them. Because if I can't afford a seat, I might go to, you know, I might go talk to Robbie and be like, hey man, your lawn care business want to sponsor a seat for me? He's going to laugh at me, you know, but, right? But, but I can do that. I could go to the people that help me, the sponsors that I have, and be like, hey, I'm thinking about putting, like, I would uh, for this year, what I would love for you to do is to buy my seat. And then we can have a one or two year deal. You know, you know, I, look, I'll, I'll give you where to buy it from. I'll give you the part number. You can actually pay for it. So, you know, you don't have to give me cash, blah, blah, blah. But now I know that I'm going to put a Kirky 88 series in instead of putting in a 10 degree layback that's some pile of crap. My mounts are going to change. My belt locations are going to change. My cage is going to change. So, Having that sponsor talk, having somebody that can help you fund it could change the looks of the car, 
the design of the car. They might want you to go run Bristol with VCTS and you can't run all the aluminum stuff. Um, the rules last year, I think you weren't allowed plastic fenders. So, you know, I'm not going to run those fenders. That's actually why Lucy has steel fenders on it. So I'm going to, I'm going to change that way. Cause he wants me to go run Bristol. They're going to pay for me to go run Bristol. Okay. Now, well, now I need to outside of the car to change, right? I need to be legal to the rules. So having that plan, walking through it is the easiest way that you can really ensure success is, and, and, as Robbie can attest to this, I'm one of the most organized, thought out, yeah. write it down plan kind of guys you'll ever meet. Like, something like that, right? <laughs> always on time. Uh, man, I am so organized. I'm always on time. Always, yeah. My plan is in my head. I, I, I do a lot of thinking. My plan ends up in my head. We're working on writing it down to be more organized. Hey, I got stuff. I'm writing stuff down for PRI this year. Because we we're, we have some success at PRI, okay? Um, I get it if you are not a plan kind of guy, if you're not an organized kind of guy or gal, right? And I understand. There's so much of what I do. There is still a lot of this build. The battery mount, the accumulator mount, I plan to put them in this location, but it was one where I'm like, I got to get the seat in, and then we're going to adapt it from there. We're going to make it happen from there, right? My steering, I knew that I wanted the electric power steering. I kind of knew how I wanted it to mount, but it was one where I needed to put the seat in so I could see where it was going to add up, left, right, in, out, how it would mount, okay, how the steering shaft. So, like, I knew I wanted that. I knew I wanted that there. But from there, I was able to improvise. Like, my steering mount with this adapter that I have, the adjuster that I have, I really like it because it looks really cool. I'm going to take it, get it powder coated. It's going to look spectacular. It's lightweight. It's easy to do. Uh, it's minimalist. But it was one where in the process of putting that in, I was like, oh, hey, what do we have for these parts? And I found this mount. That it actually says $10 right on it from when we bought it. Cool. So I was able to improvise that. But I had the plan that I knew I was going to put that there. I was going to put the electric power steering in. I knew I wanted a collapsible shaft. And then from there, we just made things happen. So uh, have you tried a LaJoy seat where you pour the compound in? Uh, a lager seat where you pour the compound in it molds to you. Uh, so no, so I have not had a molded seat. Um, I still run the Kirky 88 series. I know all about them. They're, they're actually, it's, re it's a really neat concept and they work really well because it assures you get a seat that fits you. Now I will tell you, if you're like me, where you might go down a little or you might go up a little in size, they can be a pain in the ass because <laughs> then they're molded to you and they don't fit so good. And especially if you go up in size, uh, yeah, you start contemplating life decisions, right? But they work really, really well. Almost all major tier racing programs use them. You know, NASCAR uses them, stuff like that. The beauty of that is, is that you take the idea, if you don't know what I'm talking about, is that you have a basic shell of a seat, and then you sit in it, you get comfortable, you put your arms in that where you need them to be, and then they literally just pour in an expanding foam kind of in a bag behind you, and it cures and hardens while you're sitting in it, and they come out, and then they trim it all up, and then they cover that, and that's your seat. So that's your containment seat is this outer shell that is molded to fit you. I've never tried one. I know some people that do. The price is coming down on them. Um, they're a good idea as long as they're still certified and all of that. So, yeah. But is there any other questions? Because I can't remember anything else I had as far as how to help you guys go through in the shop other than plan your shit out and slow down a little bit. Okay. So if you got any questions... We'll answer them up here real quick. Um, we are going to go live in the subscriber group. I'm going to talk to Robbie for a few minutes, and then we'll go live in there. I have two things to give away. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you guys. These ones are kind of simple. Yesterday and today, we're just going to give away a couple of Front Wheel Discussion t-shirts, but we're going to give them away to subscribers. If you're like, hey, how do I win a t-shirt? You got to be a subscriber, um, and I am just drawing random subscribers in the uh, that are subscribed to Front Wheel Discussion. For the month of December, we're giving away one thing every day. So we got to give something away from yesterday and we got to give something away today. So we're going to announce this in the subscriber group, mainly because I got to, I got to draw them between now and then too. So that's the other part of it, <laughs> but we're going to give away a couple t-shirts for these first couple of days. Uh, the exciting part is, is that I have reached out to, and I have had uh, some companies reach out to me and these giveaways might get exciting where we can actually give away some pretty cool higher dollar stuff. So yeah. Um, uh, Kenny, I will, I will try to, man, uh, message me. I can answer some messages, but 
I don't know. I got to talk to Robbie here and I don't know how long it's going to take. And I got to try to get some stuff done so that I can get home tonight because I have some stuff to get done before this weekend. So, uh, yeah, message me. I'll, I'll talk to you on Messenger for, if nothing else, and I'll see about calling you on the way home. So, and if any of you guys are like, but Todd, how can I, you know, uh, I want to call, I want to talk. Look, it's real simple. Kenny is the reason I have that Cavalier, and Kenny has sponsored the show. So he's kind of bought his way to talking to me more. So, <laughs> like Robbie, which I did see that you messaged me, and I swear to God that I thought I messaged you back, and then I realized that I didn't. So I apologize for that, my friend. But Robbie, usually, I usually message, like, I usually answer Robbie, too, because he's been there for me a lot. He's, you're one of the, like, few people that have come and helped me consistently. You made four Bristol trips with me. So, yeah. yeah. But, okay, so local front driver says this, left side of car needs to be longer than right side. Thoughts? I've never done that. The whole left side, right side thing, all right, you are going to get guys that argue with you either way. One wheelbase, the other wheelbase, and you got to have one side or this side. Okay, I can tell you that I have done this in a neon. I've done this with stock DOT tires. I've done this with Hoosiers. And I've had it where both of the rear trailing arm mounts had slots in them that I could move them. I could move those rear wheels a lot. And I didn't notice a single bit of difference. The car handled exactly the same. I accounted for rear steer. I adjusted toe slightly. I made, I found no difference whatsoever. Okay. A lot of the older school cars, a lot of the full frame cars, I actually think that wheelbase thing was more of a hidden geometry where they were finding that if they moved that back a little bit, well, what it was is they were doing caster and they were finding that wheelbase and stuff like that. That's my opinion. Um, I've had some guys be like, well, it's like stagger, but in the wheels and the shorter frame makes the corner better. And I, yeah, I, I, I don't buy into it. I've never had anything that, that I've never found any reason to do it or not do it. If somebody swears by it, cool. It might be their secret sauce. It might just be some BS that they do and the car handles well. And they attribute it to that because they did it and the car handles well. But if they did it the opposite, it would still handle just fine. So the amount of times I've had that where somebody tells me something like, dude, you got to do this. It's like, well, no, it doesn't work because of this. It's no, no, man. I've done it on every car I've ever done, and it works great. It's like, oh yeah, okay. Do you ever think that maybe it's just it doesn't do anything, and it you just keep doing it, and you have success otherwise, you know? So, yeah, uh, I think they're creating y'all. I, I, I really, it, it depends on the car because I've seen some where you know they're moving the rear axle. Well, now the thing's got some drive. You know, it's got some steer to it, right? I've seen it where by the front, they have to add so much caster and they're sliding their control arms and stuff that it, it's more caster in the left front and stuff like that. So I, I can't explain exactly why the rear wheel drive guys are so big on it, but I just, I've never found a use for it in the front wheel drives. And we've done it where we've twisted the front K members too. We used to do that where we would twist them uh, and slide them for camera and all that kind of stuff. And we couldn't do them a ton. Um, but even then, it got to a point where they were twisted and I pushed it back up and the extra caster, the car was just as good even across the front as it was longer, shorter. So, yeah. All right, guys and gals, we're going to call it quits for tonight. Glad we got this setup working. I'm glad it, it works like this. We are live on YouTube. If you guys haven't, swing over to YouTube, front discussion, subscribe. Um, we're trying to grow that up too. So, slowly, we'll get there. Uh, I asked you to hit the like button here. You know, it's what you get, okay? Uh, oh, I also seen, I think somebody said something. There was one other I seen here that I didn't answer. Uh, how about Michigan? Going to be number one in the playoffs. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I don't care. The college football playoff system is rigged. So um, I can't wait till it goes to 12 teams. So I, I can't wait for that. Yeah. All right. I'll be in the subscriber group here shortly. Thank you all for being here tonight. Hit the like button on your way out. I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow will probably be an interesting one because I'm going to try to do it from my house. Probably somehow. I don't know what the background is going to be. I don't even know what we're going to talk about yet. But it'll just be some talking one. So thank you, everyone, for being here. We'll see you guys tomorrow.